Okay. Uh, may I start? Wait, no, 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 wait a bit, Lucia, because there is a small delay. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Do you don't really want to check on YouTube whether it works? I'm checking. It's it's there. On my side, it's all, on, on my side, it says the stream is about to start. Okay. So that's why I wasn't sure, but maybe now you can see it. I can see from the from the stream control. I can see the the stream has started. Okay. Yes, uh, I'm watching. I'm watching the stream. I'm right watching sure. the stream. Okay, perfect. Well then, let, let, let's, let's start it. Salut, good morning or good afternoon. My name is Melissa Drummond. I am professor at Full Universidade Federal Fluminense, and I will be the president of this defense. So, Pedro Henrique Rocha Bruel will defend the thesis entitled Towards Transparent and Parsimonious Methods for Automatic Performance Tuning, supervised by Professor Arnaud Legrand from CNRS, France, and co-supervised by Professor Alfred Goldman from Universidade de São Paulo, Brazil, and Dr. Brice Vidou from Argonne National Lab, United States. I would like to present and thank the following members of this board for taking part of this defense. Dr. Stephen Wilde, Director of Research of Argonne National Lab, USA, who is one of the reviewers of this thesis, Dr. Albert, Albert Cohen, Director of Research of Google Research Paris, France, who is also a reviewer of the thesis, and Professor Boyana Norris from University of Oregon. Now you we'll start the first part of the defense where Pedro Henrique Rocha Bruel will present his work in approximately 45 minutes. So Pedro, please. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you to the members of the jury for agreeing to be here today as well. And today we need fast computers throughout science and engineering at different scales, from climate and weather simulation to infrastructure to the smallest scales of molecular dynamics needed for virtual drug testing. Luckily, computer performance has increased exponentially in the last decades, as we can see from the number one supercomputer in the top 500 list, whose performance has increased up to a million times since 1993. These trends in performance have been accompanied, at least until 2005, by trends in hardware design. We have now reached the frequency scaling limit, and we rely on multi-core architectures and hardware accelerators in order to sustain the performance improvements in the past. In this context, performance optimization plays an important role, and in particular, automatic performance tuning or auto-tuning is needed to deal with the increases in software complexity needed to leverage new hardware. Optimizing matrix multiplication is a classic auto-tuning problem. Here on the right, we see a sample in the C language where we performed fixed memory accesses uh, to data that we want to operate on. We can restructure these memory accesses uh, in order to leverage cache locality by, for example, blocking. Using these two new for loops, we can operate in smaller matrices that we can load preemptively into cache. We can further optimize this problem by using the unrolling of the two inner loops uh, iterations here, for example. And if we can generate this code, for example, using an auxiliary program, we can evaluate all the possible combinations of block sizes and unrolling factors, and we would have something like the search space here on the left. Here we want to find this highest point in megaflops, and we have valleys, we have ridges and plateaus at different levels. Optimizing in this search space is a considerable challenge for any optimization method, but this is still a very small problem. If we look at larger problems from the literature we see uh, from different domains in high-performance computing, we see that the search space size increases exponentially with the dimension of the search space. The problems that we studied in this thesis are highlighted in these boxes, in these figures, and if we look from further afar, we see the previous figure is in here, we see that these problems get much larger still. We studied some of these problems in this thesis, and something that all of them have in common is that they see performance as a function to be optimized. If we do that, we can adapt proven methods from other domains, such as function minimization, learning, and design of experiments. Here on the right, you see the same data as before, but now with method information. 
Now, the majority of the papers that I showed before, the 90 search spaces that are in those figures, did not report the method that they used and search space uh, specification. So it was hard to paint this picture. Function minimization and learning are not necessarily parsimonious or transparent methods, and design of experiments can help in that regard, but it's still not widely used for auto-tuning research. I was able to find a single study that uses design of experiments in all the search spaces that I showed you. In this context, the contributions of this thesis are to develop a transparent and parsimonious approach to auto-tuning based on the design of experiments and evaluate these methods in different high-performance computing domains. Transparency for us means using statistics in order to justify code optimization choices and to learn about the search space. And parsimony means that we are going to carefully choose which experiments we run in order to minimize F using as few measurements as possible. The search spaces and problems that we studied are shown in this table on the right. We studied problems from compiler parameters to CPU and GPU kernels to neural network quantization. The problems that we are going to present today are highlighted in the table, and we will start with the function minimization methods applied to auto-tuning. Here, the problem is to optimize a function, here we see Booth's function on the right, in a setting where we know or can compute some information about this function. Additionally, we can evaluate new points, x1 to xn here, with the objective of finding the global optimum, marked by this red x. Typically, we don't have such well-behaved search spaces. We see in the contour lines that smoothly we go to the optimum here. We have something like this, where we have multiple local optima. In this context, an additional task that these methods must perform is to escape these local optima. If we can compute the gradients in these search spaces, we can use Hessian and the gradient information in order to descend here and find these regions of better performing uh, configurations. Hopefully, we can reach the global optimum and we can do that iteratively in order to move in the neighborhoods of points that we know we already explored in order to descend here. If we make harder to state hypotheses, such as those made by simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, and other heuristics, we can still effectively explore these search spaces uh, in some situations. When we consider the two classes of methods that we are talking about here, we have a very large set to choose from. And the question that we must answer is how do we choose a method to a specific search space? One way to do that is to use an ensemble. For example, here we have three methods, A, B, C, exploring the same search space at the same time. If we accompany these methods as they explore and we allocate more measurements to methods that perform better, we can find a way to balance the methods that perform well with the methods that perform worse, dividing our resources, and at the end, we report our best configuration from all the methods that explore the search space. This strategy was implemented in the OpenTuner framework using a multi-armed bandit algorithm to coordinate and distribute measurements between optimization methods. We applied the OpenTuner framework in a high-level synthesis problem for FPGAs. Here, the objective is to start from some C code and generate hardware that is going to be implemented in the chip. We start this process with the LLVM compiler, which has a backend for Verilog. Uh, this hardware description language is then transformed into hardware by Quartus, which is proprietary software. These two steps expose parameters that we can target for optimization, and we implemented an auto-tuner for the high-level synthesis parameters of LegUp. Our auto-tuner targeted 65 parameters over 10 to the 123 configurations, and each evaluation of these configurations took around 10 minutes. We used as performance metric a weighted average of eight hardware metrics containing measurements of the usage of registers, memory, DSP units, but also the frequency and the clock speed of the final circuit. An expert devised weights that allowed us to optimize for different objectives, such as area, latency, performance, or multiple of these criteria at the same time. We published these results at the Reconfig conference and we evaluated the performance of this auto-tuner on 11 problems, performing up to 300 measurements per problem. The comparison baseline here were optimized leg-up configurations for the target FPGA that we were using at the time. Overall, we achieved around 10% improvements on the weighted average metric for all the scenarios that we explored 
and in some cases we were able to find configurations performing two or five times better than the defaults in some cases and for some metrics as we see here for example in the heat map for performance shown in the top right. We implemented this auto-tuner using OpenTuner and our ensemble of methods contained variations of simulated annealing, genetic algorithms and an elder mead direct search method. From this problem, we learned that the methods that we used in our ensemble explored the search space in a very unstructured way. This prevented any further statistical analysis and interpretation of results, and considering that the 300 measurements that we made are insignificant considering the size of the search space, we don't have any global sense of how the structures in the search space are. We also don't know if there are any better configurations in this case that we could find. We have a comparison baseline, but we don't know how far we can get from it. We still, uh, because of all this, we can't know how we should continue uh, or when we should stop exploring. An additional problem that we faced is that LegUp is now proprietary software, as is most of the stack for working with FPGAs. Here on the right, I'm putting this problem in context. This is the largest one we studied in this thesis, and it is large even in comparison with the largest ones that we found in the literature. We decided then to pursue sequential experiments, sequential design of experiments, as a way to add structure back to our explorations. We are now going to use modeling hypotheses, explicitly stated, in order to guide sampling and optimization in these search spaces. We are going to talk about design of experiments now, and we'll start with the linear model. Here, we have uh, no access to the function f anymore, at least no direct access. We are now restrained to look into a specific set of points or a design of experiments that is given to us beforehand. We can change that later, but at this moment, we are going to use, instead of the actual function, a model surrogate that is fit to the data points that we have. In this case, we can compute the estimator for our surrogate using a fixed expression, and we can use this in order to optimize instead of the real function. Uh, here, the variance of this estimator is independent of the actual measurements that we perform. It depends only on the experiments that we are given or that we choose, and this is important when we look at design of experiments, where the objective is exactly to minimize the variance of this estimator while at the same time decreasing the number of experiments that we need to perform to have accurate surrogates. This enables us to testing hypotheses. On the example here on the right, we see um, a function represented by these hollowed gray points. Our surrogate fit is this red line, and the experiments that we perform in this example are shown here on the center of the input range for x. If we pick the set of close points, the variance that we observe is very large. It goes uh, out of control far from these points, and the determinant of this matrix, of this experiment's matrix, is smaller than it is if we pick points apart. So if we pick these distant points, the variance of our surrogate is now much smaller, much more controlled, and the determinant of this matrix consequently is larger. The components of a design of experiments, for example, we can consider the set of experiments as a design matrix. We consider each factor column in this, in this matrix as corresponding to a parameter that we want to control in our program, and each value that a parameter can take is called a level. We can build these sorts of designs for different purposes. For example, we can use factorial designs when we can evaluate uh, many points, but we need a good model. We can use screening to test simple uh, modeling hypotheses using very few experiments. And we can also use letting hypercube and low discrepancy sampling to have a more even coverage of the search space. We are now going to talk about optimal design, where the objective is to build surrogates within a constrained budget. We are going to use explicit model modeling hypotheses in order to sample the search space in a specific way and we are going to be able to test these hypotheses as well. Here on the right we see Booth's function again uh, where we performed a random sample in it. We see these blue points as our sample. We want to find this red x which is the global optimum and the best point in our sample is represented by the red square. If we make the hypothesis that this search space is linear on the two parameters that we have, so this is the function that would be equivalent to it, we would then, using optimal design methods, sample in the corners of the search space. This would give us a surface that points in the direction of uh, where the minimum in here is, and it would be, in this case, in this corner. 
uh, this is wrong in this case, but allows us to see how this modeling hypothesis can guide sampling in the search space. If we add quadratic and interaction terms, for example, we can sample in a different way. Here we are now sampling in the centers of the input space, and we now fit a surrogate model to this data, and the prediction is much closer to the global optimum. Building these sorts of designs is made usually by swapping rows from an initial set with a very large candidate set of experiments, and it requires an initial model. We are going to maximize the determinant of our experiments matrix, consequently decreasing the variance of the surrogate model. The best design is, again, independent of the measurements that we perform. So we can pick these, these experiments beforehand. We don't have to run any experiments here. The final component of this approach that I'm presenting today is analysis of variance or ANOVA. This is a strategy to identify which of the factors and levels are more significant, have a larger impact or a different impact in performance. Here on the right, we see an ANOVA test for, three, for a factor with three levels, A, B, and C. And first, we group the observations that we have by factor and by factor level. And then we estimate distributions for the mean effects of these factors and levels. We then compare these distributions using statistical tests such as the F-test. In this example, the levels B and C are very close together, their distributions, so they are unlikely to be different, to have a different effect. On the other hand, the factor A is likely to be different than the other two. So it would be interesting to make a choice between B and C and A, but not between B and C themselves. Here, this means that we can refine our initial modeling hypotheses, and we can choose which factors to keep or remove from our initial models. These three components, design of experiments, optimal design, and analysis of variance, are used in our complete uh, technique, their complete method, that we published at the CC Grid conference together with the next applications that I will present you. First, we define a search space for a specific problem, we select an initial model, and we generate a, an experiment's uh, design for it, a design of experiments for it. We then run these experiments and run ANOVA tests. Uh, and, and then we use these tests to select a performance model that will be used in the next step, with only, for example, the most significant factors. We then fit this model to the data that we have and use this new fit, this new surrogate, to predict factor levels that are more uh, interesting to decrease performance. We now restrict the search space at this step, and then we can generate a new design for the restricted search space, which is used to uh, start the process again. This process is open to user input at every step, so we, this is why we say it's transparent. But in the experiments that I'm going to show you, we automated the execution of these experiments. The first application is an OpenCL GPU Laplacian kernel, where the objective is to detect the edges of an image, as we are doing here on the left. This OpenCL kernel was highly optimized and efficiently parameterized by experts. These configurations of different configurations of parameters for this kernel were generated by the BOST framework, and the search space was completely evaluated by another student previously. The search space here contains 10 to the 4 valid configurations, over 7 parameters that control different steps of the execution of this program. The performance metric that we used was the time per pixel, so the time to compute each pixel on these images is what we wanted to minimize. Our initial performance model compo was composed of linear and inverse terms for some of the factors to account for diverse overheads uh, of management of resources, for example, the number of threads. This is the single problem for which we have a, a tailored model like this, and we see that it has an interesting impact on the results. First, let's see a single execution, a single iteration of that loop that I showed you. Here, we first perform these experiments in green, uh, in the green crosses, and then we fit a surrogate to these experiments. The prediction of the surrogate is marked by this red point here, and the actual global minimum in the search space is represented by the blue cross. Here, we evaluated all of the experiments, all of the possible combinations of, of values in this search space, here shown in these grayed out points in the back. And so we knew, we knew where the global optimum was. When we fit a model using these two factors that were identified as significant, the predictions are marked here uh, in these images. And here we are looking at different slices of the same search space. 
We performed then a second step where we fixed two additional parameters. And it's interesting to see here first that the experiments that we perform are in a much better region of the search space because we already restricted the search space in the first step. Uh, but also we see that we made the wrong prediction here for the number of threads. At the third step, we, fi we fix an additional factor and we perform these experiments that are shown here. We perform less experiments here because our models become smaller as we cut factors from it. And on the right, we see the ANOVA table that guides the exploration in the search space. So we see first that the size of the model, the number of terms that we consider, is smaller at each step. And also we see highlighted the factors that were identified as significant and removed and fixed at each step. So this allows us to understand the reasoning behind each of the choices of our algorithm. We performed an evaluation of, this, uh, of different optimization methods in the search space. We are showing seven of them here. Uh, we have, since we knew where the global optimum was, we could compare our solutions, the solutions that were found with the global optimum. And first, we see, okay, on the x-axis, we see the solutions from the distance from the optimum. And on the y-axis, we see a frequency count over a thousand repetitions within a budget of 120 measurements. We see that random sampling performed uh, interestingly well in this case. So we found configurations that were at most 1.5 times slower than the global optimum. And the maximum was, was this. Okay, the, the mean of these configurations, of these experiments, is shown here in these dashed red lines. And when we compared other methods with random sampling, for example, we performed a Latin hypercube sampling in the search space, We've, we see here worse configurations, perhaps because we are exploring other regions of the search space that we didn't before. When we run greedy search, we lose the results that we had. The maximum is now over there in the right uh, outside of the graph in this case. If we do a greedy search with restarts, we get some of the performance back. A genetic algorithm in this case performs more or less equivalent to random sampling. But if we do these two approaches here, uh, the first one, LM, uses the same cycle that we discussed, but instead of using optimal designs at each step, it just uses a random sample in that space. We almost always find the global optimum, although sometimes we get it wrong over there on the right. If we do quantile regression, trying to model the smallest configurations instead of uh, taking into account all the configurations that we found, we also get very good results uh, with relation to the most frequent that we find, but also we get some wrong points here on the on the right. If we use optimal designs at each step, we always find this global optimum and the maximum is always in there. So we, because we effectively restrict the search space here and because our modeling hypotheses are right, this uh, happens all of the time over the 1000 repetitions. An additional benefit that we have here is that we use only half the budget that is all allocated for these experiments because we are using analysis of variance and removing factors at each step. When we see no factor that are that is significant, we can stop exploring. And this allowed us to use only half the budget in this case. A second application that we performed here was on SPAPT kernels. These consist of 16 kernels on multiple high-performance computing domains. The code variations were generated by Oreo, and we had a set of constraints that was different for each kernel. These search spaces are too large to completely evaluate, and in this case, we used the same performance model, the same starting model for, for all of the kernels, a polynomial of degree 3. We see here the sizes of these search spaces. They go from 10 to the 36 to 10 to the 7. They are larger than the previous example, but they are smaller than the first FPGA uh, use case that we presented. Summarizing these results, we are looking at a single kernel here, the big G kernel. We see that our approach, represented by these columns here on the right, found configurations that were very far from the, the baseline of comparison here, which was the O3 compiler uh, parameter. But we did not improve upon the random sampling approach in this case. No matter what we tried, we tried different uh, variations of our approach. But on the other hand, we found these configurations much faster than a random sample in this case. 
we believe this happened because the two most practically significant factors here were related to uh, threads, uh, parallelization and vectorization, and they were identified at the first and second steps of our approach. So very quickly, we were able to set these factors and these parameters and restrict the search space to better performing configurations. At the end, other factors were significant, uh, statistically significant as well, but they didn't have a very large impact on performance. We performed four steps of our approach in some of the cases with a budget restricted to 300 measurements for random sampling as well. We are left here with this question, is there anything that we can find in this search space? So we tried multiple things, we tried uh, our, our models here, and we didn't find any better configurations than a random sample. Uh, we also don't know how far we are from the global optimum here, so maybe we are close to it, maybe we are far. Uh, maybe our search space, uh, our search space strategy, to, uh, our strategy to explore the search space is not effective in this case. So, in summary of these applications of our approach, we first saw that random sampling has a good performance. Uh, maybe this is due to the abundance of local optima that we have in our search spaces. First, we had motivating results in the Laplacian kernel, where we had knowledge of the search space and also a very good starting model that we could, we could leverage, so we could exploit that structure. We also perform a broader evaluation uh, in SPAP kernels, but in this case, we couldn't improve upon random sampling, so we don't know if there is something else that we could find it here. Uh, and, also, and also, we don't know if we could find this uh, better points by exploiting the structure in the way that we were doing with polynomials, for example. We explored here different abstraction levels from the algorithm to the implementation and the compiler, but we didn't explore the hardware or the OS uh, parameters in this case. Maybe to improve these configurations better, we would need to combine these levels effectively. We don't know how to do that in this case yet. Uh, so finally, we, we used a sequential and incremental approach here, which performed definitive search space restrictions at every step and had to wait until all experiments were completed in a design in order to improve the surrogate model. We used here relatively rigid surrogate models, although they were informed, uh, and we don't know if this is the best approach for these kinds of problems, so this motivated us to pursue a more flexible approach. For example, we tried to use Gaussian process regression, and in addition to the flexibility that they provide, they also allow us to balance exploitation of the search space structure with unrestricted explorations. So we don't have to perform uh, restrictions in the search space in order to continue exploring. We can look at it more globally. We are now going to present uh, our approach with using Gaussian process regression and what we applied it to. Here, the problem is the same as for the linear model. We are trying to fit a surrogate to some data that was previously obtained. Here, instead of having a set of parameters, we are now sampling over functions. Each of these lines that we see here in this figure is a function that was sampled by our, uh, from our surrogate distribution. We can condition this distribution to experiments that we have. For example, if we observe one point, we can now make all the functions go through this point, all the functions that we sample, and we can control how far they go from this point. If we continue performing experiments, we can start to get a sense of the mean of the surrogate and also of the variance on the regions that we didn't explore. Here we have the same kind of question as for the linear model. How do we choose these experiments in order to improve the surrogate? We can target, for example, minimizing this function f. We want to find the best point. We also can target building an accurate surrogate. So we want to have a, a small variance or we want to have a very good surrogate in the regions that we have interest in. But maybe we can do both. We can try to combine these two strategies together. One way to start optimization to have a good uh, coverage or a good sense of the search space is space filling design. Uh, so we can, for example, motivate this using a uniform random sample in two dimensions. Here we see that we have some holes in the search space, some regions without samples, and some clumps of points that get uh, clustered together in other regions. 
this becomes worse when we are looking at higher dimensions because all of the points that we sample would be on the shell of the search space because this is where the volume is when we increase the dimension. There are strategies to deal with this. Latin hypercube sampling partitions the search space and then sample in these different partitions. It might be needed to, to optimize the, the sample that is produced later. Uh, and we can also use these low discrepancy deterministic space filling sequences. So these provide us with uniform coverage of the search space in a deterministic way, but also respecting some randomness properties. It provides us with a uniform starting sample for our surrogates and can be used later on to interpret the, the significances of the factors that we explore. Still, they are more complex than ANOVA. They still need many samples and we can't, uh, at the same time, we were not able to leverage them effectively in this example. Okay, so suppose that we have this function that we want to minimize. This is represented here by this red squiggly line. We have the minimum that we want to find in this red dashed line, and we want to decide where to measure. We can first start with a, a low discrepancy design. We can put these four experiments here, well spaced, and we fit a Gaussian process surrogate to it. So in here we have the Gaussian process mean, we have its variance represented by these purple shaded areas, and we want to decide where to explore now after we did these initial experiments. We can choose these three strategies. For example, we can decide to explore by looking at the regions where variance is the maximum. We can decide to exploit by looking at the minimum prediction of our model, of the mean of this model, and we can try to balance this uh, explore, exploration with the exploitation by using the Gaussian process mean and the confidence interval that we have here with these shaded regions. There's a fourth approach, which is the one we used in our work here, which is to balance, to use, to pursue the maximum expected improvement. The intuition behind the formula that computes the expected improvement here on the bottom left is that we are trying to use our surrogate, the variance and the mean of the surrogate, and try to, to balance it, to combine it with the best point that we found so far. So we are trying to compute a probability that each of these factor levels is going to improve upon the configuration that we have so far. So we applied this strategy first to our previous problems, to the OpenCL kernel, for example, uh, when compared to the more simple approach or to the more informed surrogate that we performed, that we employed earlier, the Gaussian process regression approach was not able to improve upon these results. We believe this happens because this approach, since it uh, evaluates a new point to, to measure at each step, it requires more measurements in order to, to find the best point here. And in this case, the more informed model performed better. We also applied this strategy to the big G kernel uh, that we showed before in the SPAPT problems. We found here better configurations than random sampling, so they are statistically significant. We can see their confidence intervals here, but the difference is very small. So practically, they are not uh, better than random sampling. We found some interesting outliers that could point us to interesting directions, but we did not explore them further in this case. The final problem that I'm going to present today is the application of Gaussian process regression to the quantization of the neural network layers in a, in a problem of image identification. Here, the problem that we want to, to optimize is the bit allocation for each layer in a neural network. Here on the left, we see the original network with eight bits per layers. So we already decrease the bits that uh, each layer has. In this case, the network has 25.5 megabytes in size and an accuracy of 97%. This is a baseline of comparison for our optimizers. And what the optimizers can do is choose a different precision for each layer. For example, here we have five, three, and four, which gives a network uh, in, with 10 megabytes in size but in this case, the performance, the accuracy is degraded to 55% in the data set. The target data set for this problem was the ImageNet data set, and the network that we target was ResNet 50. This network has 10 to the 48 possible combinations of bit allocations for each layer, and we tried to find the best one within this 10 megabyte limit. The two metrics that we used for 
to measure our, our optimizers were first top one, meaning that the correct class in the, in, in the data set is the most probable prediction made by the network. We also used top five, where the correct class in the data set is within the set of the five most probable predictions that the network makes. Again, the constraints required that the networks be below or at 10 megabytes in size. And for we targeted top five as an optimization metric. So we had these two metrics, but we chose top five in this problem. We compared the performance of Gaussian process regression in this problem with random sampling, with a space filling design approach using SOBOL samples, and with a baseline reinforcement learning uh, method that we used from a paper. So we had this paper and we reproduced their results. They used reinforcement learning and we compared their, our results to them. Here on the bottom right, we see two, um, two metrics, top one and top five. And we see that the, the two methods, reinforcement learning and Gaussian process regression or GPR here, found configurations that were very close to the original un uh, unquantized or um, uniformly quantized network with eight bits per layer, both for top five and top one. We targeted top five just to remember this. Uh, an interesting thing that we that we found here, although our method was not able to improve upon the reinforcement learning approach, the more simple methods that we applied, the uniform sampling and SOBOL sample, also performed surprisingly well. So they are uh, pretty close to the original unquantized network already. Here on the bottom right, we see the evolution of the configurations that were picked by Gaussian process regression in green and reinforcement learning in orange, just to show that these methods perform um, similarly over time. We tried to interpret these results, but the, our interpretations were inconclusive in this case. We saw that the first and the last layers were more significant, so this means they should keep their bits. And although we identified that all the layers are significant in this case, we were not able to separate between uh, each of the layers, so which layer should be considered more important in this case or, or less. We were not able to differentiate in this case. Still, we didn't consider interactions here, so this could change the entire uh, analysis and optimization in this case because there are clear interactions between the layers in a network. We also tried optimizing for size and top five using a weighted average like we did before. We adapted the reinforcement learning algorithm for it, but it was not built for that, so the Gaussian process surrogate was more stable in this case. We were able to find bit width uh, allocations that were more stable for, for different runs, for multiple runs. An additional benefit that Gaussian process regression have is that we can fit a Gaussian process to all the data that we collected. This would enable us to leverage an entire data set of experiments, but it's extremely time consuming. It's unclear for us if we could do that with reinforcement learning or how we would do that without having to replay the every experiment. And this would not guarantee that we get the same result. If we fit the Gaussian process to this data, we can immediately find the best points that we, that we found already. Uh, we could try to improve this interpretation of the results to use to express structure with kernels that could recover some interpretability if we used linear or uh, polynomial kernels, maybe periodic. This could help us uh, guide exploration more in this kind of search space. And in the end, we pursued more flexibility with Gaussian process regression. In this case, we did not need an accurate modeling hypothesis. We could start optimizing right away. On the other hand, the results are harder, were harder for us at least to interpret, and we didn't always achieve better optimization. For example, on the OpenCL kernel, we are not able to improve upon the design of experiments approach. This means for us that sometimes, or in some cases, the effort to build a good model, a good performance model, can pay off at the end by guiding optimization in a more uh, precise way. We used online learning approaches such as expected improvement in order to decide where to measure at each new experiment without having to complete a batch before um, improving the surrogate and to balance exploitation and exploration. We didn't perform restrictions to subspaces in here, so we were looking at the global, the entire region of the search space at all the time. 
We used space filling designs to be able to sample more uniformly in high dimension. And we filtered experiments in all of our uh, applications here to go around constraints that we had in every problem. We tried two different approaches, but they, they didn't work that well for us. In our cases, we just filtered in our applications. Putting this problem into context, this is the not the largest one that we explored. It's the second one in comparison with LegUp, but it's smaller than the original paper with which we compared. It's listed here on the top. They used also the activation weights, uh, the activation values at each layer uh, together with the weights. So they had a larger search space to explore. We used only weights in our problem. So uh, in conclusion, we need fast computers today at different scales, uh, at different domains in high performance computing, and we can't improve performance in the same way that we did before. So we now have a frequency scaling limit, and this generates a series of problems, a series of large optimization problems in different domains of high performance computing. These problems are very large and we need some way to effectively explore them and optimize for them. And in this context, the contributions of this thesis were to develop transparent and parsimonious auto-tuning methods based on the design of experiments and evaluate the, perform of the, the performance of these methods and others in different high-performance computing domains. The applications that we talked about in this thesis are highlighted on the table again. And first, we saw function minimization methods that optimize the target function directly, making hypotheses that are not always clear. Uh, we should use these when modeling is very hard, when we can't really uh, build performance models or the search space is too large. We then looked at design of experiments as a way to optimize more informed surrogates, performing this sequential and incremental approach. And we should use this when we have a performance model or when we think we can build one that represents the search space more or less accurately. We also saw applications of learning with Gaussian process regression, where the objective was to balance exploration and exploitation and to choose experiments online, meaning we don't have to complete batches of experiments to improve a surrogate. These allow us to build more flexible surrogates in some situations, and we should use them when we need this extra flexibility so simple models don't work, or when we have something that is too hard to model and we can't really uh, begin to 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 bet on a, on a model to start with. So taking a step back, we had to solve many similar problems during this thesis. Each application required redoing work, deciding how to present the results, how to analyze these results. And benchmarks such as SPAPT are very rare. We don't have uh, benchmarks that, pre that present completely evaluated search spaces or with performance models yet. Uh, in this context, we believe that we need to do collaborative, exhaustive, and reproducible experiments in order to push auto-tuning uh, work further. For example, we could completely evaluate, even if just a few search spaces, this would be an exhaustive measurement that could come with a global optimum knowledge or a, a performance model that we could use to compare optimization methods with. We can also leverage the entire domain, uh, the, the works in different domains of auto-tuning, performing collaborative experiments. This is already done for thing, in things like the collective uh, mind experiments. Uh, and we can leverage community efforts in this way. Even if we don't evaluate completely these search spaces, we can collaboratively decide on architectures or uh, performance models that fit better in different search spaces. And these two approaches, exhaustive and collaborative experiments, we believe are interdependent and, and they can help us to achieve reproducibility in auto-tuning research. Uh, this could allow us to target different domains, different levels in the hardware and software stack uh, to optimize more effectively. Uh, this is what I had to present today. I would like to thank the jury again for being here and thank you all. I will now happily answer any questions. Thank you, Pedro, for your very good presentation. And now we start the second part of the defense where the board makes questions and discusses the work. To start the questions, I would like to invite the reviewers. So please, uh, I, would, I would like to invite Dr. Albert Cohen. 
initially. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this was a very good, very clear and well-structured presentation. Um, I, I'm very glad to be uh, to be here. I mean, I'm not an expert on uh, this, uh, the statistical methods you are using and uh, uh, design of experiments, etc. I, I read a few papers in the area, uh, area but I'm not at all uh, uh, a specialist on, on the topic, unlike uh, other members of the committee. Uh, I'm more working on the problems that you're trying to, to tune. Uh, to auto-tune and optimize, including some of the tools that you are using. Uh, and I'm very interested in development in this area. As you clearly state in the physics, uh, this is a very uh, underdeveloped uh, area. There are lots of published results that have very little methodology and make uh, claims that are hard to sustain um, quantitatively, or uh, we are lacking the, the tools to do that, and some people don't even care much. So I think there, there is plenty of room for, for improvement, and your thesis is a great progress in, the, in this area. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I, I realized that you spent a lot of time building uh, infrastructure and environment to, to, to test your ideas and explore the different aspects of the problem, and uh, this is really a, a, a huge amount of work. And uh, that, that actually leads me to my first question. So I was wondering, uh, so you don't have to tell the, the full history of the thesis, but um, why did you not consider alternative um, approaches maybe more uh, of the sort that you described at the beginning, like improving open tuner, for example, uh, essentially reproducing existing results, uh, debunking ex existing papers, rather than actually trying to solve uh, new problems or variations on, on new problems, which involve more work on the infrastructure side? We, we had opportunity to work at different uh, problems and in this case I decide I, I think we took them uh, meaning that we we could optimize for different search spaces that uh, came to us in at different from, from different people for example we collaborated with industrial partners in the FPGA case and then later we did in the, the convolutional neural networks application. And to, to me, the most important part was to pursue the, these new methods, these different methods that I, I thought could bring more, that we thought could bring more uh, information to the surrogates that we used, to, to the explorations that we performed. Uh, instead of continuing that direction, we decided to, to explore more the, the methods spectrum instead of the problem spectrum, I think. I, yeah, I, I see that, that, that uh, trend in the, in the document and in the presentation. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I think another another aspect related to this is some of the um, uh, some of the results over the years have also been uh, uh, I mean some, sorry some of the publication uh, practice or I don't know what's hot in the field in the community has been evolving over the years. And uh, I see more and more papers these days interested in methodology uh, at least on, on the quantitative evaluation side uh, compared to uh, four five years back. Um, and, and I think this is a, an important trend. Uh, it's still difficult to publish these kind of results if you don't bring anything new to the user, if you only bring uh, like methodological progress or uh, parsimonious um, uh, uh, experiments that essentially don't improve on the speed-ups or anything like this. It's still hard to publish, but I, I'm seeing some, some improvement. Uh, so I would encourage you and anyone to, to continue on that, I think, scientifically important uh, trend. Uh, I have a second question, which is a little bit more, let's say, directly interested. Um, so I've been working on um, a project that uh, attempts at essentially making the, the search space more separable in a, in a cogeneration problem. Uh, so in uh, the typical, uh, I mean, you had an example at the beginning of loop styling and this kind of loop transformation. Um, so as long as you play with uh, loop si uh, like tile sizes, uh, it's completely separable. So you can essentially, as long as tile sizes are like ordered in a, spe in, in a specific way, uh, in, in a correct way, you, you can do anything and it's going to be uh, correct. Uh, but then you dig further and things become a bit more tricky, like uh, when you have divisibility constraints. Uh, so you didn't say what happens when um, the unrolling factor, for example, of the inner loop does not divide the the, the immediately uh, uh, enclosing tile size, uh, etc. You can have these kind of constraints at every level, and there are much more tricky interactions uh, as well. I'm just taking that as an example. So it's it's interesting to see that some frameworks have, let's say, default strategies or like graceful degradations to handle these situations softly, while some other cogeneration frameworks just fail. Uh, they, they they have constraints that may be detected or they may just fail. Actually, it may not be correct. 
in case those constraints are not satisfied. So I don't know how you deal with that. Uh, is this something that um, the tool should be addressing ahead of time, or is it something that the um, design of experiments can address? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in your uh, thoughts on that. So in, in our experiments, we had problems with dealing with constraints. Our The tools that we used, for example, Oreo, it already deals with the constraints for us. It, uh, it is able to decide whether a, a point is valid or not, according to the constraints that we have. Uh, what we did in our case was to just generate a very large sample that covered the search space well. We used space fill in designs for that. And then we filtered the experiments that were not uh, useful or did not respect the constraints. And in, in the case of the design of experiments approach, this was not a major concern because we could fit the surrogate using the points that we had. And that could give us could, could point us already to the directions that we wanted to optimize. Still, we tried some more complex approaches to restrict sampling directly. So let's compute these constraints beforehand and then sample in a in a space defined that, that respect these constraints. But we were not very successful in that direction. We tried many things, but uh, it didn't work in this case. This could be something worth exploring. How to sample. Uh, while already res respecting the constraints that we have. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. I mean, that's also an intuition we have, so, but only recently, that making the problem differentiable, for example, through surrogates, is, uh, is going to help a lot. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about uh, space filling. I mean, uh, of course, in higher dimensions, it's more difficult, um, or, or you will end up being much less parsimonious, as you say. Uh, so, um, I, I understand. And, and um, uh, so constraints is one thing. Another thing is um, uh, pruning. So sometimes you have some performance model that could be learned as well, but or can be analytical, um, that tells you that some combinations of um, of levels are uh, irrelevant. Uh, like you, you can even use branch and bound, for example, in, a, in, 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 a mid, in the middle of uh, a multi-arm bandit. And people use that for games and all kinds of optimization problems. So once again, so in, in case you have these pruning techniques, so it's not like illegal, it's just irrelevant. Once again, how do you take that into account? Uh, f with the design of experiments approach, it would be hard to do that. We would have to have models that operate in, in these restricted regions. We could deal with them in, in our applications in the same way by filtering out uh, configurations that are not relevant. But I don't think it would be very effective to use design of experiments in this scenario. Maybe something more flexible like Gaussian process regression could would be able to to give more importance to the points where where you know that they are more important. Uh, we can also try to to force sampling in these regions, and uh, which would be essentially filtering in in that case. But yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Yes. Again, making things soft rather than hard may generally help. Um, maybe one uh, um, yeah one last question. So uh, on if you can. Go to slide 24. It's more like a clarification, because that's something I understood differently when reading your thesis. I think we are here. Um, yes. No. Uh, yeah. Basically, I don't understand what you mean exactly by uh, practically insignificant but statistically significant. Oh. In in the thesis, you talk about speed ups being uh, negligible, or basically you 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 you, you simplify the you, you reduce the the, the space. But you don't get any speed up, which is great. I mean, it's one of your goals. So, what do you exactly mean here? So, here I mean that a factor is statistically significant when we can see that it, the results of this test, of this statistical test that we make, are below a threshold. So these are these would be statistically significant, but this doesn't tell you, doesn't tell us at this point about the impact or the magnitude of the impact of this factor. So it is significant, it's able to be detected, but it might have a very small impact. And the the size, the magnitude of the impact would be uh, the practical the practical significance of this of this factor. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, so I, I I could have a few more technical um, questions on the specific optimization problems that you you studied, but I don't think this is a interesting to uh, to everyone here so I, I'm, I'm done with my questions okay thank you okay thank you and now let's go to the other reviewer 
so please dr stefan wild you can initiate your questions so thanks also for the very nice presentation and for the excellent thesis very well organized uh, i enjoyed reading it um so i have a, a few questions many of them philosophical but let's start with one in terms of the actual problem that you're trying to solve so there's stochasticity in all of the measurements that you are are, are getting for your performance criteria what what are you actually trying to solve are you trying to have the best average performance the best best case performance the best worst case performance what is the actual objective that you're trying to accomplish in this work yeah with with the with these methods uh maybe we can say that we have different objectives that are implicit with the usage of each of them but in this case for example when we have a search space that that is is completely uh, riddled with local optima we would like to find the global one so this would be the best case that we can can find uh, it would of course depend on the the measurement error that we get but in this case the objective would be let's find the best point uh, and, and maybe that's the same objective with the the surrogates uh, with the gaussian process surrogates we are trying to to find the best point uh, in each of these cases so the best case performance uh, when we try to build models on the other hand maybe we are trying to uh, account for for the average as well so let's uh, get rid of the measurement error let's try to identify some structure that we can exploit maybe all we are identifying here are the average cases or the average best uh, scenarios so i would i would say it depends on on the method that we use but our objective for us would be to find the best point that we can in these search spaces uh, even if we use a, a method sure, that yeah. is not the best for that yeah i guess my question is what does best mean and so i think maybe what you mean by best is the average over the stochastic realizations epsilon you, you mean notation. okay considering the error yes uh, the best would be on on average with the measurement error the the best case that we can find yes okay yeah and part of the reason i ask that of course is because sometimes the specific performance design that is best on average can have a very large variance due to this heteroskedasticity effect that you say okay and you know it could be that someone that when when someone wants to run one of these kernels for example they would say well i don't care that it performs best on average because sometimes it's really it, it takes forever to run right um and so um yeah so th this is one of the questions i have in terms of the overall um motivation and so i guess uh, uh, along these same lines is if you were able to decrease the variability that you see at any one of these parameter values would this help your methods and in what way would it help with the methods so for the for the design of experiments application we we seek to minimize the variance of each of these of these uh, parameters of or of the surrogate overall if we had a surrogate uh, if we had a search space where variance is already small i believe we would have uh, better better surrogates in this kind of of design of experiments approach we because we are trying to fit these models or we would be able at least to identify the modeling hypotheses are wrong or not be able to identify that they uh, have an impact i think that could help uh, this kind of approach uh, but but also for the for the gaussian process regression i think it would be less impactful because we try to model the variance at every step as well so in, the, in these cases, if we have very large variance or the variance changes or even uh, heterosedasticity, I think wouldn't be too impactful in these cases uh, as, as it is for the, for the more informed models or more rigid models of design of experiments. Okay. And then um, I guess maybe one last question since we have a lot of people asking questions, which is about the correctness of the output. So do you do anything in your methods to see that when you go change these performance parameters that you are getting correct output? Yes. And what, and what do you do if you do something? Yes, uh, at every at every 
one of these applications, we always verify correctness of the programs. And if the program is not, uh, it doesn't have the correct output, we drop it out of the, of the set, as we do for filtering around constraints, for example. We just consider it as uh, an invalid point, a point that does not uh, enter in the analysis. Um, and and they, they have an impact in that regard. So we can sample a lot of points and they are all invalid, so we drop them. We don't measure, uh, we don't consider their, their, their performance. Even if it has uh, some valid time in seconds that it took to compute the wrong answer, we don't consider it in the, in the fitting of the surrogates or in the exploration for simulated annealing, for example. They, they are left out. So then my second part of the question, same question is, um, so in the Gaussian process, for example, you say you exclude it from the fitting of the Gaussian process, but presumably you still have large uncertainty that is going to then in this balance of exploration and exploitation, pull you back to that <laughs> invalid point. What do you do in practice in your approach to avoid that? We didn't uh, account for this possibility in the approaches that we used. If if we are always uh, brought to the same point, we are going to to always uh, report that it is invalid. Uh, in the Open Tuner framework, uh, it it uses uh, an infinite uh, value to to pull that out of the of the equation. But in the Gaussian process uh, regression uh, surrogates, we we don't we don't consider that. Uh, the thing the thing could be that when we fit this Gaussian process to the data that we use, the data that we consider as candidates for the next point to evaluate is also pruned at each step. So when we are going to decide where to look at next, we already removed the points that had uh, invalid configurations. So they wouldn't be picked again in that sense. We don't do that explicitly uh, to account for that, but we do this uh, as the method is implemented. We remove these points from the search space when we have uh, invalid points or when they don't respect the constraints. They don't enter in the candidate set for, for fitting or for, or for selection. That's what we do. Great, thanks. Thanks, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now I'd like to invite Professor Boyana Norris. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, and so I have, um, I don't have philosophical questions as much as um, uh, I did notice that in the future work, you said that you would consider starting point uh, impact, but in your own uh, work so far, how uh, did you choose your search starting points? Um, or did you just use the default for whatever problem you were considering? Uh, it, it depended on the application and the method. For example, in OpenTuner, I think we just picked a random point in the search space. We could give it a starting point as the default, like you mentioned, but in our applications, we started with a random point with the FPGA example. In the SPEPT kernels, we used um, a random sampling, a random sample in that space as well as a starting point. So the best point in that random sample was the starting point. Uh, and in some cases, we could pick as well the the best configuration. For example, the uh, neural network application. The starting point was the fully quantized network, and from that we we started modifying. Uh, in general, what we tried to do was uh, a space filling or a uniform sample in the search space, and picking the best point that we found as the starting best point, and compare the improvements to to it. And, and this is all still within your budget of um, how many values? Okay. Yes. Um, let's see, where's my... Uh, yes, the models that you um, considered, um, I know it's hard to, to... I'm curious about the history of how you decided... Well, you had the, the cubic polynomial, and then, of course, you did... Um, the Gaussian process uh, approach, but but did you consider other things, and why did they get thrown out? If you did, so in in the first application in the Laplacian kernel, we had a performance model that was devised already uh, by the experts. So we used this as a starting model. 
in the case of the SPAPT kernels, we decided to start with this uh, cubic model. We had no hypotheses that were specific for each of these applications, each of these kernels. So we picked a model that we considered that was flexible enough. We didn't know in these specific cases how to model the, the overheads in, in management of resources for each kernel. So we started with the most uh, general or the most flexible model that we could pick for these kernels. This was our reasoning. And at each step, at each uh, step of the approach, we could prune this. Uh, we could not add complexity here. So maybe a thing that we could try is to try adding new new factors or new, new model terms. Uh, but we didn't do that in here. And um, my um, uh, last technical question, I guess, is, uh, and it might be a, a nonsense question, so I don't know, I'm not an expert in uh, Latin hypercube sampling, but did you sample over the values or over the indices of the parameters, I guess? We sampled over the indices of the parameters, yes. Because we would have, for example, okay. if we had the, the uh, powers of two, we would be sampling in a wrong way in this case. We are sampling over the right, indices. So permuting, permuting the values would influence that. I was trying to understand why um, random outperformed in some cases this, which was very counterintuitive. And I think that might point to, because uh, mm. the ordering is somewhat arbitrary and, and probably not ideal of, of the, the actual values, right? Um, at least I'm speaking for SPEP, which is the only thing I would know. Um, so that may be another thing to consider, possibly, is, is how the order matters and, and what could be changed to make um, space filling approaches better. You mean, for example, if we could uh, sample in the indices and not on the values? I don't know if I understood correctly. No, I'm just saying that um, uh, right now you're sampling over the indices, but those are random in a way, uh, and, okay. and, you know, arbitrary, not random. That they, it would be better actually if they maybe were random, and, and so that might be another thing to consider is randomizing the values within the um, parameter vectors first, and and then do what you do. Okay. It may not do anything, but it just occurred to me that, that the human imposed ordering may, may be less than ideal. Um, can you, oh, I did have another really, I mean, a slide six, um, if you can go back to that. Um, and I know your thesis, you did consider those methods, the uh, local methods, but in slide six. This um, one? Yes, um, it seemed to not include the uh, direct search method, you know, Nelder Meet and, and company. Is that true? Um, what you're talking about here in this plot? It this or is. Is it included? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, th this is for the for the data that I'm showing here. Uh, I picked the search spaces or the papers that I was showing here that used specific approaches it this is not comprehensive it's just a a sample of this sir of, of the the entire body of work it's not uh, the entire uh, okay so so it could be that they use but did not specify and so you weren't able to tease that out okay so I understand. yes that. yes um that's it for me that was great thank you okay thank you now i think it's me because the other members are advisors, right? So, Pedro, initially I'd like to congratulate you. You have worked very hard with several subjects from many research areas and obtained very interesting results in those works. Uh, you have already answered some questions I had, but I still have some other questions. Uh, initially, concerning the title of your thesis, did you co do you consider uh, performance tuning in general or applied to HPC? What do you think that the lessons you learned are valid only when you consider HPC applications or in general? I have only applied the methods that 
we studied or uh, to HPC applications or to, to applications using these different kinds of hardware and different CPUs and parallel programming. But I think that the methods in principle could be transposed to other to other domains. There, there is nothing specific about the uh, design of experiments approach or Gaussian process regression or the sampling strategies or heuristics that uh, would prevent them from being applied in different domains. I believe they could be effectively applied as well in different performance modeling tasks. Okay, I think you you could uh, emphasize this because although the title do not does not mention HPC applications, it's implicit sometimes that uh, it uh, the focus is only on HPC applications. So uh, I have some small comments or small suggestions, minor suggestions that I will send you later if you desire. And I will give you only my general comments, okay? Uh, I like it a lot, the figure 7.1, uh, because it presents not only the optimi optimization methods discussed and applied in your thesis, but the decisions you must take to choose a specific auto-tune strategy, which is the main contribution of your work, I think. I'm trying to, to the, pick this figure on the thesis so that I can show you, everybody. Uh, yes. Okay. Sorry about the delay. <laughs> Okay, it is transmitting now to the stream, but you can't see it. Should I should I change to the to the thesis here? Okay, you're talking about this figure that I'm showing now. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. And I think uh, in your presentation, in slide 35, it was a summary of you presented in this figure in detail. Yes, I tried to, and yes. I think that's, yes, you tried it. So I think it's, uh, in my opinion, it seems to be the main contribution of your work, how to decide which methods to use in which context. And sometimes I think it, um, it was lost in the, the text, in, in my opinion. And I like this figure a lot, and I think it, you should call attention to this, to, to, this it's li to this figure and to the slide 35, because we have lots of methods, and I think your main contribution is uh, methodology to choose one of these methods to improve the application. And sometimes when I was reading your text, I got a little bit confused. So I I like your presentation when you you presented in slide thirty five a summary of I think you described in detail in this figure. Uh, concerning the part one of your work, I particularly like the chapter three, where you describe the optimization methods, and the, concerning chapter four, where you describe the learning strategy to build surrogates, I, I, I wondered, did you consider using principal component analysis to reduce the number of parameters instead of analysis of variance? Because Many times you you say you, you write about reducing the number of parameters, the dimension of the problem, and you didn't mention the PCA methods. Did you consider to use it? We we didn't use the the PCA method because for us in the uh, analysis of variance application, we were interested as well in determining each uh, factor, each model term, 
uh, important. Each model term is important, not just uh, in the case of the PCA to represent the search space using less dimensions or a projection in less dimensions. We wanted also to be able to um, identify, for example, if a quadratic term is meaningful or if an inverse term is meaningful. And for each of these terms, which would be the best uh, place to look at? And the PCA doesn't let us do that in this level of, of granularity. That's why we didn't consider it for this application. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not uh, sure. I don't know. Because when you, you reduce in, uh, in another dimension, in a smaller dimension, I think you eliminate some parameters or dimensions that are not important. No. I'm not well. Okay, if you consider it, and uh, you thought it was, it wouldn't work in your, in your analysis. It's okay, but uh, I'm not totally sure that uh, it could be eliminated. Uh, this idea could be eliminated. i I don't know. And uh, um, oh, let me see. Okay. Ah, okay. You also uh, one of your contributions was a uh, design of experiment uh, library uh, programmed in Julia, isn't it? Yes, uh, during the, the study that we performed, we wrote some code and we packaged it in this library. Yes, and how is this library organized? What does it offer? In which context can it be used? How? It was not clear for me. Oh, in, in principle. Better. Yes, uh, yes. Can I use the, your library? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, wow. It is a, it, it's an implementation of simple strategies for design of experiments. So we have factorial designs and we have screening designs for sampling in, uh, to, to test linear models, sampling in very few regions. We also implemented the, uh, the, the optimal algorithm that I discussed in the design of experiments chapter, uh, swiping rows of candidate sets and trying to minimize the variance. So that is also available there. If you have a, a search space that you have a model for or that you want to test a model and you want to build a design, you can use the library to express these designs and express these, um, the, these questions that you want to ask to, for, for, of, your, of your data. You can do that in that library. Uh, it, it has these things. Uh, it's not extensively still extensively implemented in other uh, regions, so we don't have uh more than that this is what we have there but it's it's still it's still it's usable it has continuous integration and automated tests so it's it's possible to use it okay thank you oh, let me see if i had any other important comments no oh, okay okay for me thank you okay <laughs> Pedro, thank you and now we have the comments of the advisors, so I, I, we can start with Bruce Vidal, please. Thank, thank you. Um, I, I don't have questions. Uh, I have uh, comments, of course, for Pedro. Thank you very much, Pedro, for the presentation. Thank you for all these years working together uh you've made i think a, a great contribution um other training methods uh come from other areas of science uh where things are simpler uh i've been trained as a chemist uh, we use auto tuning methods we use design of experiments but usually in chemistry in the real world things are contiguous things are smooth you get error of measurements, but if you repeat them enough, usually you get something that makes sense. Computer science, uh, this is completely different. Uh, the space are hollow, the space are irregular. There are uh, impacts of 
parity of parameters, which won't make sense in the natural world, unless you go down to quantum chemistry. So I think adapting those methods that come from other areas of science, uh, like physics and chemistry, uh, to computer science is a very big undertaking. Uh, undertaking. Uh, and I thank you very much for uh, accepting to do uh, this very uh, daunting work. Uh, this is something I, I've tried dealing with also, and it's very difficult. So thank you very much, Pedro, for all this hard work. Uh, you are a wonderful person to work with, and you're also a, 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 a now a very accomplished researcher uh, with its own uh, his own will. I mean, Pedro will always go where he thinks he needs to go, and and, and not uh, when you tell him to do what you tell him to do. He will do what is best, and uh, he is very independent in this way, and, uh, but also uh, very thoughtful and, and very thorough in his work. So thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you, please. Thank you. And now I'd like to invite Alfred Goldman, the other co-supervisor. Thank you, Alfred, for inviting me to the board, you and Arno Legrand. Uh, thank you, Lucia. Uh, I, I just can say that it was really wonderful to work with Pedro these years. First of all, I do not know if all of you know Pedro did not have a master. It is a doctorate, direct doctorate. It's something that is um, getting usual in Brazil, but it's not so usual yet. And with Pedro, I had the opportunity to work with wonderful people. On behalf of them, I will thank to work with Arnaud. It was my first time working closely with Arnaud. I know him for several years. I will not tell how many because it's kind of a shame we are getting old but it was the first time that we could work together and it was really nice and i was really happy to see all the work that pedro did because even if he presented just a part of it he did much more for instance he has this auto tuning tool he has this julia tool and more amazingly this figure that uh, lucia liked it very much was the figure that Pedro, I think he started this figure about two years ago, and he keeps refining it. It was amazing. He Every time that we had a meeting, Pedro, oh, look at this figure. I chatted that, I chatted this. So it was really something that I said, oh, why this figure was not on the presentation? <laughs> I did not understand. This is my question, Pedro. Why this figure was not on the presentation? Just that. Uh, well, as as Lucia mentioned, it it's I tried to put it in the last slide, but uh, it's too com complicated to go through all of them. Uh, I think it was easier to to disassemble this and present it in more in, in a slide form. It wouldn't fit in the slide mostly, but it was easy to to talk about it instead of showing in the in the graph. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It was a great pleasure to work with Pedro all these years. Thank you, Alfred. You're muted, Lucia. Lucia, you are muted. Uh, sorry. And now, Professor Arnaud Legrand, please. Okay. Thanks a lot, Lucia. So I find not to be long. Um, so it's, it's been an incredible pleasure to meet and, and work with Pedro from the start to the very end of the thesis. So, because not only Pedro is rigorous, he's incredibly reliable, but he's also particularly enthusiastic. And, and I've always been impressed by how easily he goes and digs with absolutely no fear in sometimes highly theoretical works, often completely outside of his initial expertise, but which are actually incredibly relevant for the problem we were investigating. So that he, he brought us with very civil times. Hey, I just found this paper. Uh, I think it's relevant. And we're like, yes, what, wait, wait, what is this? And so we, we learned a lot. That, that was really uh, exciting. Uh, so I, I think being able to go outside your, your, our comfort zone is, is an essential, essential quality for a scientist. And so there's just no doubt for me regarding Pedro uh, that he's now become an accomplished researcher. 
uh, as you may know, th this thesis has been my, my first occasion of working on auto tuning and design of experiments. Uh, I truly loved it. It was hard. Uh, many attempts uh, were inconclusive, whereas many articles made it look like it was easy. Uh, so it's been science in action, and it struck me that in computer science, not, not just auto tuning, I mean, this is a general comment, okay? In computer science, I, I feel like we're still at the stage where not only we, we don't know why some methods work in general, but even worse, we often do not even know why some methods have worked, even after reading the paper, even trying to reproduce the work, we're doing the experiments and we're still, okay, it works in that case, but why? And, and we still don't know. So that's, I think we still have a lot of progress uh, in our domain to, to do uh, <laughs> regarding this kind of, of, of things. And so that's really what Pedro has been trying to do, understanding why. Why is this working? Why is this not working? And that that was that was hard, and and we learned a lot, really a lot in the end. So I really loved the great discussions we had with Pedro. So so thank you, Alfredo, for offering me to good advice, Pedro, for introducing me to this very nice guy uh, on this particularly challenging subject. And thank you, Pedro, for well for for everything, because <laughs> it's been it's been wonderful. Thank you, Arno. You're muted, Lucia. <laughs> Your mic is still, is still off. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry. So we have the third part of the defense wh when the, um, the members, the board will deliberate about the work. So Pedro, you have to leave this room and come back later when I know we will call you. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay. Uh, I am leaving thank now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, for everyone that is in in watching this presentation we have a gather town uh, room that we can that we can meet i'm just going to to share it with you let me put it in the chat so if you want to join we can we can talk until they finish deliberating thank you everybody to to watch this
Okay. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes, yes. I'm enabling my camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, Pedro. So now I will read the decision of the committee. Okay. Um, Pedro Henrique Rocha Bruel investigated methods for automatic performance tuning. In the first part of his work, he surveyed several methods and their applications to auto tuning, such as optimization strategies, design of experiments, and online learning methods. In the second part of his work, he applied some of those methods to different auto-tuning problems. He presented a significant amount of experiments which have been performed on different applications domains. It's a multidisciplinary research work requiring a robust knowledge of statistical models, optimization methods, and the applications being tuned. The thesis relies on a good balance between experiments and survey work trying to focus both on statistical models and developing a methodology allowing for conducting rigorous experimental results one can trust. It's hard to see in this domain a thesis aligned rigor both on the experimental part and the statistical analysis part. Also, the fact these rigorous methods have been applied to the design and implementation of auto-tuning algorithms and tools is particularly original and promising. Pedro Bruel showed a very good and wide knowledge of both the applications, domains, statistics, optimization methods, and an impressive understanding of technical details. The organization of the presentation and the selection of the most significant results highlighted the originality and impact of the results. Throughout the presentation, it was easy to follow the rational for adapting experimental methodology to the construction of auto-tuning algorithms and tools and their evaluation. Pedro Bruel made a very pedagogical and didactic presentation. The talk was very fluent and pleasant to follow, and the presentation was backed up by good illustrations and sketches. Pedro Bruel had his work published in several good international conferences, and although not all the work has been published yet, the thesis contains yet unpublished material that we encourage him to publish. Pedro Henrique also produced laboratory notebooks and developed open source design of experiments libraries to improve experimental reproducibility. Pedro Bruel gave very relevant answers to the numerous questions from the committee. Answers to questions were precise and to the point. For all the reasons, the PhD committee decided the unanimously to attribute to Pedro Henrique Rocha Bruel the title of Docteur de l'Université de Grenoble Alpes in the field of informatique. Congratulations, Pedro. <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks the members of the jury for being here today, for making questions and reading my work. Thank you, my advisors, Alfredo, Arnaud, and Brice. Uh, it was an immense honor working with you all. I learned a lot from you, and I hope we can continue working together in the future. So now I think you have to... Uh, Arnaud, please. Yes. To indicate what's next. So uh, I, I think what's next. To, uh, there is a process verbal, the soutenance, that is the doctorat that I have to yeah. fill. So, yeah, uh, so the text we, we just wrote should be copied in this document, in this process verbal. Okay, and okay. you should sign for all of us uh, as a, as a um, show you on this, uh, on a similar okay. one. An example. I'm sharing but with you. you. You, you don't have to do it now. I mean, it's fine. No? Uh, ah, okay. No no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. So what you will do, you write, you sign it, then you will send it to all of us so that we just, and we can just answer, say it's okay. Okay. Uh, and then you will send it to the doctoral school and you will be done. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Lucia, for okay. taking your 
all the oh, just to let it clear on the president's side the jury was me <laughs> as a president albert oyana uh, lucia and stefan we have just okay. five people on the president's side but you you will receive the certificates don't worry okay. thank you very much again. <laughs> okay thank you very much you. <laughs> so i think it's all for you isn't it <laughs> Yes. Yeah, congratulations, Pedro. Thank you, everybody. Okay. I will stop the stream now. Okay, thank you. Congratulations.